Luke chapter 24 is where we are today. Luke chapter 24. As we complete our sermon series uh, on the miracle man. Today we will finish that up. Next Sunday we'll begin a new sermon series called Foundations for Families. You don't want to miss out on that. You'll really be blessed by it. I think we'll be able to look biblically at some issues that are certainly important especially in our day and time now that uh, interacts with the families. Luke chapter 24, as we finish this sermon series, last week we talked about the resurrection of Christ, the greatest of all miracles. Today we'll look at the remainder of Luke chapter 24 and unpack this evidence that's being proven through the resurrected Christ showing Himself to two of His followers on the road to Emmaus. So Luke chapter 24, it's a little bit lengthy, but follow as I read, beginning in verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus Himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know Him. And He said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you are having one with another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to Him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in word and deed before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we are hoping that if he it was he who was going to redeem Israel, indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find His body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said He was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. Uh, but Him they did not see. Then He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and entered into His glory? And beginning of Moses and all the prophets, He expounded to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and He inclined that He would have gone further. But they constrained Him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And He went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the Scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So we all know who Muhammad Ali is, right? He always had no trouble with self-confidence, right? Or self-image. He knew that he was the greatest of all time, and he said one time that you, if you even dream about beating me, you should wake up and apologize. Right? <laughs> so Muhammad Ali is said one time was on a plane, airplane ride, and the turbulence came in. It got pretty rough. And while the turbulence was rough, the uh, the airplane pilot came on the intercom and said, "Everybody needs to sit down and fasten their seat belts." So everybody did so with haste, except for Muhammad Ali. He stood up strutting around, and one of the stewardess came over and said, "Sir, you need to put your seat belt on." Muhammad Ali, in his usual way, would say, hey, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And then the stewardess looked back and said, sir, Superman didn't need no plane either. <laughs> uh, so here's what I want to tell you this, that if you claim to be the best, you got to back it up, amen? 
Muhammad Ali said he didn't need a seatbelt, that he certainly needed a plane. Jesus Christ claimed that he was the Son of God, and he backed it up through the resurrection. Amen? Amen. We talked about that at length last week. And last week we left off with the women who saw the empty tomb. They came back and told the disciples, hey, the tomb is empty. His body is no longer there. Something amazing has happened. But today we're going to talk about an appearance where Jesus showed up to two of His disciples on the road to Emmaus and showed Himself alive and well. Amen? And Jesus is still doing that today. Inside churches all across our city, all across our country, all across the world, Jesus is showing up and showing Himself alive and well able to reveal Himself to us in a supernatural way and transform our lives. That's your greatest need here today. Your greatest need here today is not to come in and to be able to have your ears tickled or come in and have be encouraged in something to make your best life. Now your purpose for today is to hear that good news of Jesus and how He wants to do a transformational work in your heart. Here's what I know though. If you put your hopes in a person you're always going to be disappointed, right? You put your hopes in a spouse, eventually you'll be disappointed. You put your hopes in a friend, eventually you'll be disappointed. You put your hopes in a boss, eventually you'll be disappointed. If you put your hopes in a pastor, eventually you'll be disappointed. Why? Because even the best men are men at best, right? We are all have feet of clay. That we all have a backstage that doesn't always uh, reflect our front stage. But Jesus Christ will never disappoint us. If you are following Jesus, He can bring the goods. He did what He said He would do. He not only died for us, not only was He placed in a cold, hard tomb, but He arose from the dead. And he's causing us to have transformational power in our lives. We talked about at length last week. Now there's three credentials of Christ that makes Him uh, evident to us that He is who He says He is. That He is the Son of God. That He is the Messiah. That He is the Christ. That He is the hope. Number one was His impact on history. No one person has impacted history the way Christ has. Jesus, all through the Gospel accounts, has the plethora of miracles that we have been unpacked in the last two months. He impacted lives. He touched people, and anything that Jesus touches, changes. Amen? That He made a significant difference. But He also made a difference in the church after His resurrection. As we looked through our sermon series a, a little while ago, in the book of Acts, do it again, Lord, do it again, we saw the big difference with the disciples. Before Jesus was resurrected, before the Holy Spirit that came upon them, they were in great fear and trepidation. They were hiding out in the upper room, afraid of the same authorities that had crucified and killed Christ. But a big difference took place when they witnessed and realized and staked their life in the resurrection of Christ. And when the Holy Spirit came to live inside of them and empower them, they were forever different. They were changed. They went from being cowards to being bold witnesses for Jesus. They went from hiding to save their own skin to being willing to die for Christ. Well, what's the difference? This truth of the resurrection and the infilling of the Holy Spirit of God. Not only that, but all through history, Jesus has made an impact. Even the way we calculate the years and time and the counters broken down upon this man named Jesus Christ. That there was a before and there was an after and even how we calculate time. But the same way should be true in your life. There should be a B.C., a before Christ, and now there's an after Christ in your life. When you look at your life and whether you were saved as a young child or you were saved as an older adult, there should be evidence that Jesus has changed you. That there was a before and there's an after. Now it's called your testimony. That there's an example in your life that you're now a new creature because of Christ. Not just because of you trying to have a New Year's resolution. Not because you tried to have kind of new life goals. Not because you read a self-help book. But because Jesus invaded your life. Amen? Amen? And He's now in control of your life. That your life is now based upon His priorities. That your life is now based upon His desires for you. You're no longer your own God. You've let Jesus be 
become the rightful Lord of your life. Is that true for you? The impact that Jesus made. Number two is the resurrection. What we've talked at length about. You see, Christianity stands or falls on the tenet of this faith. The resurrection. If Jesus did not rise from the grave, then nothing else really matters. But if Jesus indeed rose from the grave, then nothing else matters. That we can stake our life, we can stake our here and our hereafter on that truth. Again, as we said last week, if any of the naysayers, if any of the critics, if any of those who wanted to ruin and destroy and stop Christianity, when it first began, all they had to do was produce the body of Christ. But they could not do it. And I can tell you this, my friends, when we visited Israel years ago, we went to the tomb where Jesus was buried, and it is empty. Amen? And there's a sign on the door that says, He is not here, for He has risen. Everybody say risen. 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 That's an important part. Number three, fulfilled prophecy. So not only did Jesus impact history, not only was the resurrection irrefutably true, but also fulfilled prophecy. There's about 300 prophecies from the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled in His birth, His life, His ministry, His death, and His resurrection. 300. And it would be absolutely impossible for anybody to conceive a way to plan these out to try to fulfill the Old Testament prophets in their own ability. Number one, nobody gets to choose when and how they're born, right? And through His ministry, all the things that Jesus did fulfilled these prophecies to the complete accuracy. It'd be impossible that mathematicians, people far smarter than me, have done great research. And they said that if only seven of the prophecies of the Old Testament happened the way that they say it did, the way that Jesus fulfilled, it'd be like filling the state of Texas, which is a big state, right, Alexandra? Filling the state of Texas like 30 feet deep with silver coins. And only one of those coins, you put a little cross on a mark, you throw it out in the middle of the state, and you send a blind man with a blindfold on to go find that one coin. The odds of finding that one coin would be the likelihood of Jesus just filling seven of those miracles. And He fulfills 300 of them. In our passage today, we're going to see kind of all these three credentials coming together. We see the impact that He has on these individuals, these disciples, the change that He makes in their life. We also see the resurrection. We see Jesus in His resurrected form appearing, not in a figment of their imagination. Not just in a spiritual way. Not just resurrecting in their hearts or in their minds. But a physical resurrection. Somebody could sit down and have a meal with these disciples. And we also see fulfilled prophecy. We see how Jesus dips back in the Old Testament. Looks at all the Old Testament. Says the Old Testament pointed to me and is fulfilled in me. So in your outline inside your worship bulletin, point number one. It's the reunion with Jesus. The reunion with Jesus. It says this in verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. Two of them. Two of what? Two disciples. So these were two individuals that had spent time in ministry with Jesus. They began to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Now you remember even Jesus' apostles had a misunderstanding of the kind of Savior that they wanted out of Jesus. They wanted the political, military, cultural, social Savior. They wanted the Savior that could feed them with, a, with fish. That could overthrow the tables in the temple. That could stand up against the Roman authorities. That could hold back the religious oppressors. They wanted an earthly Messiah, but Jesus had a much bigger plan and purpose. These were two disciples that no doubt were with Jesus during the Passion Week. They were on the backside. They were on the. Uh, they were supporting characters. They were not mentioned of before this or after this, but they were eyewitnesses of all these things that had been taking place the week before this interaction here. And they were traveling on the road to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. If you remember that the week that Jesus died also lined up with an Old Testament uh, uh, feast called the Passover. 
at the end of the Passover, which took place at the end of that Saturday the Sabbath, there was many people traveling home. So we see these two probably on a road by themselves, but in reality, there may have been a large gathering of exodus from Jerusalem. They say during these high and holy weeks in the Old Testament that millions of people would come into Jerusalem when the city was only about a 200,000 member city. And it would be a huge influx. And it caused a lot of changes. And now they would be leaving and going home. And these two, as they were going home, were not in a great mental state. Their hopes, their dreams, their ambitions were dashed. The things they thought would come to be did not come to be. And this man that they are putting their great confidence in was no longer alive, they believed, and this tomb was now empty, and they were confused, they were perplexed, they didn't know what was next. And they talked together all these things which had happened. And that talk together in the original language of the New Testament means that they were arguing, they were debating. They were having a deep conversation. So that brings me to my first thought. Some people wonder and debate who these two disciples were. Later we'll talk about one's name being Cleopas. We don't know the other individual's names. Most people think that they were two male disciple friends traveling to and from. But I believe it was husband and wife. You know why? It says that they were arguing. <laughs> arguing as they were traveling, all right? I bet old Cleopas was refusing to ask for directions or something, and his wife didn't know that. <laughs> Reminds me of a husband and wife, you know. The husband was frustrated with his wife and said, Woman, I can't just I can't understand why God would make you so pretty but so dumb. <laughs> she says to him, God had to make me pretty so that you would love me. And maybe dumb, so I love you. <laughs> so I don't know, but I believe, it's a, I believe it's a husband and wife. It could be two buddies. I have no idea. But they're traveling and they're having a deep discussion. They're having an argument. And I'll tell you this. Number one, the positive side of that, that we should be passionate about our beliefs and our convictions. Amen? That talking about Jesus should get us in, uh, animated. It should get us excited. It should be something that people can tell. Lights are fire. That speaking about Jesus puts wind in our sail. That talking about Jesus isn't something we can just give or take. We get passionate about certain things, right? You get excited when you talk about UK basketball. You get excited when you talk about your small business. You get excited when you talk about police work. Whatever you're involved in and you're excited about, you talk about it. Well, we should be talking about Jesus. Amen. He should be somebody that we are excited about. That's the positive side. Now the negative side is this. I can assure you that arguing with people about Jesus doesn't have very much good outcome. That more heat than light is generated by arguing. That if you are just arguing with your co-workers or arguing with your family or arguing with your neighbors about Jesus, the likelihood of winning them are very small. The way that people come to faith in Christ is through love and service. Amen? That you speak the truth in love. That you never compromise your convictions. You don't have to celebrate in people's sin. But you can also speak the truth in such a way that it's able to be received by the other person. You don't need to argue. You just love and serve. Amen? Because it's the Holy Spirit's job to do the convicting and the convincing. People already know that they're out of relationship and fellowship with God. And when we come along and love and serve, and then when the opportunity arises, speak that truth and loving kindness, then God can use that to bring people into relationship with Christ. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, or they argued, that Jesus Himself drew near and went with them. So I ask you this, if Jesus were to eavesdrop in your conversation, what would He hear? Is your conversations something that would bring honor and glory to Him? Or would your conversations be something that make Jesus blush? Do your conversations lift other people up? Or do your conversations tear people down? Understand that you are accountable for your words. You know that? The Bible says in Matthew 12, 36 that we will give an account for every idle word that we speak. Everything that you say, you're accountable to God for. Now, first of all, that should get us excited to know that even whenever other people don't recognize 
the words of encouragement, the blessings we're trying to extend, God sees it. But it should also cause us to be very, uh, very aware that even the idle things, even the passing comments that we make, God sees those and God recognizes those. So what's that mean? Gossip, right? Are you careful with gossip? Are you careful with flattery? What's the difference between flattery and gossip? Gossip is saying behind someone's back what you wouldn't say to their face. And flattery is saying to someone's face what you wouldn't say behind their back. Are you, are you a liar? Do you use your words to tear people down? Do you say cuss words? Do you use God's name in vain? So well, that's not that big deal, preacher. I can tell you it's one of the top ten, amen? <laughs> Don't use God's name in vain. If someone says God's name in vain, and you say, well, why did you do that? Well, I didn't mean anything by it. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. That's the problem. You're saying God's name and don't mean anything by it. God's name is to be high and holy. Amen? Amen. Are you not only using your words not to say negative things, are you using words in a positive direction to speak words of life to people? Proverbs talks at length about a word fitly spoken. It's like apples of gold and pictures of silver. That your words can bring life and healing and hope to people or can destroy them. Every one of us can remember in our lives with somebody, maybe even a parent or a coach or a spouse, who has said something that has scarred you so deep that you still hold on to it today, right? I know we all can probably imagine those things. And we talk about how physical wounds are, are easy to heal, but those emotional wounds, those wounds that take place usually by words, last perpetually. So let this serve as a reminder to you that Jesus is eavesdropping on your conversations. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know Him. So we're not going to get in a big debate about uh, you know human responsibility and God's sovereignty, but this is talking about here that their eyes, they couldn't see Jesus for who He really was. Their eyes were restrained. They didn't see that this was Christ three feet beside of them. That there was some spiritual blindness that was taking place. What I believe to be the case is that the devil in John 6 talks about he, the God of this world blinds the minds of those who believe not. Actually, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. That the devil blinds the minds of those who believe not. That the devil wants to put a blinder up so that you don't see Jesus for who He really is. The last thing the devil wants you to do is to see that Christ is a way for you to escape His grasp. That through relationship with Jesus, your sins can be forgiven. That you can get a fresh start with Christ. That you can be made new in Jesus. That you don't have to stay a victim and in bondage to your old way of life. That Christ has something bigger and better for you. But also, even for those of us who know and love Jesus, the last thing the devil wants us to do is to understand that who we are in Christ. He doesn't want us to live in that full victory. He doesn't want us to sense the nearness of God. He wants us to feel like that we're distant from Him and that God doesn't really love us. He saved us but doesn't really love us. That God really doesn't have a plan for our life. That you're really not that important to God. These are things that we have to wrestle with and see Jesus for who He really is. Amen? We want to see Christ for who He really is. We want our eyes open for that to happen. Christ has to intervene. So here they were, these two disciples, I believe a husband and wife, were walking down the road. They were walking away from Jerusalem. They were walking away from Jesus. But Jesus was pursuing them. Amen? Jesus is pursuing you here today. That He is pursuing after you. If you are here today, you're not a believer in Christ. That you've never trusted in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. He is pursuing after you. The Bible paints a picture of this, that we, before we come to faith in Christ, we are running as fast, as hard as we can, away from the Savior toward our sin. But the good news is, Jesus can run faster than we can. Amen? He can overtake us. He can capture us. He can grab a hold of us, even as we're running headlong to destruction. But maybe you're here today and you are a believer in Christ. Maybe you are religious, but you're not walking with Jesus. These disciples were doing they knew some religious truth, but they were walking away from Jesus. Jesus overcame them. That's the way Jesus always does. 
He pursues us in our brokenness. He pursues us in our lostness. He pursues us in our misunderstandings, our misinformation. He pursues after us and wants to capture our hearts. He wants to capture your heart today. But he was there beside him and they didn't recognize him. It reminds me of the Russian cosmonauts. And when the big space race was taking place, Russia against America, the Russians were kind of in the lead. They made the first trip into the orbit. And when they were up in the orbit, the cosmonauts would come back and they would proudly boast, we've been to heaven and we don't see God anywhere. There was a preacher out in Texas, W.A. Criswell. He said, well, I'll tell you this. I'm going to pull up the next Sunday. So I'll tell you this. They may not have seen Jesus while they are in space. If they would have taken their space helmet off, they would have seen it. <laughs> so let me tell you this, my friends. We can see Christ, but only by faith today. The Bible talks about whenever Jesus was talking to Thomas, remember doubting Thomas, he said, I won't believe in the resurrection of Christ unless I touch the wounds in his hand and his side. And he came and showed himself. And Thomas believed, and Jesus' response was to him, Hey, you believe because you've seen, but blessed are those who believe when they haven't seen. Jesus has resurrected and He's ascended. He's now in heaven. So we don't physically see His resurrected body, but we see it by faith. Amen? We believe it by faith in what the Bible says about who Christ is. Number two, it's the request from Jesus. The request from Jesus. Verse 17. And He said to them, Jesus said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have one with another as you walk and are sad? As I was reading that verse, I kind of thought about the undercover boss. You ever seen that show, The Undercover Boss? you got the number one in an organization that comes incognito, puts a disguise on, grows a beard out, whatever it is, comes into the business at an entry-level position and sees people up front and personal what kind of work ethic they have or the lack thereof, how their honesty is or how their dishonesty is, what they're complaining about or what they're celebrating. The undercover boss learns so much in that position. Amen? And here's what Jesus did. He just kind of comes along in His disguised form. They don't recognize Him. He's listening to their conversations, seeing what they really believe. And He makes a request to them. What is it that you're so troubled by? Number three, the reply of the reply to Jesus. The reply to Jesus. Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? I imagine in my sanctified imagination that at some point in time later, Cleopas kind of went, I really say that to Jesus. <laughs> Here he was asking Jesus, do you not know what just happened? Are you the only stranger here? Of course, Jesus was the one that was the center character of all this. And Cleopas just didn't see that and said, are you the only one who's unaware? Now, we do that quite often today. You know, we can talk about Jesus not knowing our pain and our struggles. Jesus, don't you know what's taking place in my life? God, don't you know what the doctor just told me or told me about my child? Or don't you know about the hard relationship that I'm in? God, don't you know the financial challenges that I'm having? God, don't you know, my friends, Jesus knows all things. Amen. God just paints on a canvas bigger than we can see. We only see a few of the brush strokes. We only see a little bit of the image when Jesus sees the entire thing and He is telling us that He's got a plan and He's got a purpose. That He is in charge. That He does see that life is not out of His control. And even when it feels like it's out of our control, we don't have to worry about Jesus pacing heaven, wringing His hands, calling for an emergency business meeting. Amen? That He is in control. That He sees. That He cares. The Bible paints a picture about the eyes of God running to and fro throughout the earth. And He sees all things. He sees your need today. He's not abandoned you and He has not forsaken you. And He said to them, what things? So they said to Him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all these people. Okay, so here they are. These were disciples. They had heard about Jesus. They had a missed 
skewed a misunderstanding of what Christ really came to do. So I would call them religious but lost. They thought highly of Jesus. They thought that He was a prophet or a good teacher, that He may have been the Messiah, that He was going to come and conquer the Romans. But they didn't know the true spiritual truth of Christ. They didn't know that He was the resurrected Son of God. They had a misunderstanding of who Jesus was. That's still the problem today. When people think about Christ, they think that He may have been just a great teacher, that He may have just been an inspirational figure, that He was a mighty prophet, that He could do powerful things, but they don't believe that He is indeed the one and only Son of God, the only way of salvation. And how the chief priests had our rulers delivered Him to condemn to death and crucify Him. So this was the reply to Jesus. This is what they spoke with Him. Again, I believe that they had some head knowledge, but they did not have heart belief at this point in time. Many people, I believe, are only 18 inches away from heaven. That's the difference in distance between their head and their heart. <laughs> they got head knowledge about Jesus. They've heard some truth about Christ. They've been around the church for some period of time. They may even own a Bible and can say some Christian truths. But Jesus hasn't gotten down into their heart. He's not started to impact their lives. It's all up here in the cranium and not down here in their heart. But it's impacting their day-to-day -day life. That's what Jesus wants to be. All right, number four is the rebuke of Jesus. The rebuke. Number four is the rebuke of Jesus. We see that verses 25 through 27. Then He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. So here's where the prophecy comes into play. That Jesus says, I've been here with you, or this truth has been before you through the Old Testament. You saw this manifested and displayed in Jesus Christ, yet you still don't believe. We'll talk about this at length in just a moment. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded to them all the Scripture, the things concerning Himself, the disciples' eyes opened. So here's what we think here. That Jesus took them back to the Old Testament and taught them about Him through the Old Testament truths. So He was saying all the Old Testament points towards Me. So understand that we live in a time where some people kind of have a dichotomy. That they say the New Testament is all that we need today. And I'll be honest with you, I spend more time studying the New Testament than the Old Testament. But all the Bible is equally inspired by God. Amen? But not all the Bible is equally inspiring to us. <laughs> some of it's some hard reading, man. Some of the Old Testament like reading the phone book. But it's all there for a purpose. It's all there for a meaning. All the Old Testament points forward to Jesus and the New Testament points back to Him. All the Bible is inspired by God for us. All the Bible is necessary. The entire Bible is necessary for us to have a full picture of who God is. And you should be a student of both the Old and the New Testament. I was telling someone about this just yesterday, that when people come to the Bible, they want to pick and choose the parts of the Bible that they want to hold on to, the parts they want to send away. Thomas Jefferson, you remember him? One of the presidents, he had a Jefferson's Bible. He'd go in there and he would choose the parts of Scripture that he wanted in it, and the parts he didn't want in it, he would cut out. He actually had a Bible where he cut out the parts that he didn't agree with. How sad that is. How is that a man who puts himself over God's Word instead of under where we belong? Amen? Some people believe I call that Dalmatian theology. They believe the Bible's inspired in spots. <laughs> All the Bible's inspired by God, right? And so when you come to the Bible and you're reading truth in the Bible, even if you disagree with it, even if you don't understand it, even if it's not the way that you would do things, you conform to it. Amen? You don't make the Bible conform to you. You conform to the Bible. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. We've always been people of the book if you are a genuine believer in Jesus. That you come to the Bible and you say, this book is authoritative in my life. That this book is something that I will say I'm going to hinge my life upon this. That this is the center and the circumference. 
This is the way God speaks to us today. And you've heard me say it many times before that God's not limited to His Word. That God is more than just the Bible. The Bible is God's baby food for us. Entry level stuff. But we can spend our entire life studying the Bible and only begin to scratch the surface. God is so much bigger and grander and more magnificent than we could ever imagine. We'll spend eternity unpacking the mysteries of who God really is. But He gives us the Bible. It's all that we need for now to hear His plan of salvation, to respond to that, and to know it gives God honor, gives God glory. Amen? What you do with the Bible determines what God will do with you. What we as a church do with the Bible will determine what God does with us. Jesus jumps back in the Old Testament and begins to preach it to them. Romans 10.17 is on the front of your worship bulletin. I gave it to you to meditate on this week. It says this, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That means that God's Word being spoken and read and in your conscience and in your ear is valuable and important. That's how your faith gets built up. So when you're reading it yourself, you're kind of uh, hearing it in your mind, right? When you're hearing the preaching of it, it's in your mind. Whenever you're listening to the Bible on cassette, that's old school, right? On MP3, if you're doing a Hisna Air One or K-Love or any of the preaching on the radio, whatever you can do, get yourself under God's Word as often as you can. Understand that we need to be both under and in God's Word, not over it. So important. So it builds our faith. And lastly, number five, it's the recognition of Jesus. The recognition of Jesus. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and He indicated that He would have gone further. So here's Jesus. They don't yet recognize Him. They've had this conversation. He just had a sermon with them through the Old Testament. The greatest sermon never recorded. I would have loved to heard that sermon. Amen. Jesus no doubt jumped in the Old Testament. Start with Genesis 3.15. The first mention of the Gospel in the Bible, Genesis 3.15, all the way back in the third chapter of the book, talks about how the Son of God would have victory over the devil. Then all through the Old Testament, we see pictures of Christ. I bet Jesus hung back. He may have began with Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham has sacrificed his son on Mount Moriah. The same mountain chain that... 4,000 years later that Jesus died on Calvary, on Golgotha. And I can assure you that Golgotha was not a suburb of Jerusalem. It was the place of the skull, the place that represented death, the place where the Romans would kill people on a consistent basis. He spoke about that. I believe he may have fast forward into Exodus. And, uh, and when it talks about the death angel who comes and passes over those who have the blood applied to the door, he said, this was speaking about me. He probably jumped into the uh, prophets and spoke about how they spoke about a judgment that would come unless you would repent and come to faith in Christ. So that's the same way that you come to believe in me is by repentance and faith. He unpacked that Old Testament. He spoke those truths to them. They came to the place called Emmaus and the two disciples were going to go into their home. That's why I believe they're husband and wife. Another reason. And Jesus would tell them he was going to walk away. Way Jesus is, right? We'll talk about it at length. That He never barges His way into our lives. That He doesn't come to their home and, like a SWAT team and kick the door down and force Himself in. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. So Jesus makes the initiative. He comes into contact with you. He overtakes you. He comes up and grabs the hold and begins to reveal truth to you. But you then have to receive Him into your home. That you by faith got to receive Him in. Is he not? He's going to walk by. He's not going to force Himself upon any of us. We by faith have to receive Him into our life. That's the way salvation takes place. But that's also how the Christian life works on a daily basis. Every day, God is speaking to you, encouraging you, directing you, but He's not going to force you like a robot to do anything. 
you by faith get to cooperate with them. That you can't do it without God, but He won't do it without you. That you've got to let Him into the home of your life. You just walk by and hear. But they constrained Him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And He went in to stay with them. So here we see hospitality. Do you know hospitality is kind of a Christian virtue that is overlooked sometimes? We see throughout Scripture hospitality. People are using their resources, specifically their homes, to bring ministry and glory to God. Just yesterday we had Barbara Engel with our mission women open her home and let the women come into their home to be able to do ministry. In just a few moments, Brother Eric will speak about the next mission men opens his home for us to be able to come in. That's important for us to do. Use your home for fellowship for other believers. But I challenge you even further. Use your home as a ministry center to bring those who are lost into it. Bring your, use your home as a place where those who are far from God know it's a safe place to come. That they're able to be there to see and to hear the Gospel in very tangible ways. Parents, make your home the place that your kids want to bring their friends to. Make your home a place where the kids that are friends with your kids want to be in your home, number one, so you can keep an eye on them, amen? But number two, you get to be an influence on them. That you get to show and demonstrate with your life and your lips who Jesus is. Hospitality. For ministers of the Gospel, in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, hospitality is part of the qualifications for them. That we use what we have for God's glory. That's often my, my prayer in my life. And this is not a natural spiritual giftedness for me. Because I like to keep my stuff locked down. Amen. I'm a, I'm a germaphobe. Don't bring your dirty, nasty people in my house. But anyway, you're supposed to use your home, use your car, use your resources, use anything you have for God's glory. Can you look at your stuff and literally say, God, this belongs to you. My home is not mine. It belongs to you. I'm going to first invite you into it, and I'm going to invite as many people as I can to enjoy this in the name of Jesus. To bring honor and glory to Him. And that's what these disciples did. And because they invited Jesus in, they got to have this intimate fellowship with Him. Abide with us. Now it came to pass, as He sat at the table with them, that He took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Now, I know that Jesus was a Baptist because He ate a lot. Amen? Everywhere you see Jesus going, He is eating some meals with folks. He enjoyed food. And in that day and time, eating a meal was a little bit uh, more emphasized than it is today. In that day and time, that eating a meal was like the hub of your activities. This was a huge, like the whole day was planned for your meal time. And that you would bring family and friends together. And you wouldn't rush it. There wasn't a game system to run off to or a ball game to get to or being rushed to stop through McDonald's. You made this a high priority to spend this intentional time together. And I think it would be beneficial to still do that today. That if we made that a high priority today as families, where we make it say, this is a priority for us that we're going to set around the kitchen table. Good night. I said from my TV set on my couch, but I need to do better. Amen. <laughs> Confession. We need to do a better job of coming together intentionally and having communication in the meal. You know why? Because you spell love. T-I-M-E. The way that you show love to people that you care about is by spending time with them. When we're always on a rush and always busy, run the next project, run the next game, doing the next thing. We are just living life, but we're not embracing life. We're not investing in our loved ones closely. Jesus did this often. I love Jesus because He never seemed like He was in a rush. He accomplished everything that God the Father wanted Him to do. And His earthly ministry only lasted three and a half years. He was never in a rush saying, man, i got to go, i got to go, i got to go. Anytime someone came up and wanted time with Jesus, He gave them that opportunity. He would set at meals. He would spend time alone in prayer. He would take His disciples off to a solitude place. He would do everything that God wanted Him to do, but He was never in a rush. He would spend time doing the important things and hearing He did that, even in His resurrected form. 
And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while He talked with us on the road? And while He opened the Scriptures to us? So here it says that as they were setting, as they were enjoying the meal, something clicked. This whole walk for seven miles, they heard this guy teaching, they were in interaction with him, he was going to walk by their home, they invited him in out of hospitality, they were setting at the meal, and all of a sudden something changed. Oh, this is Jesus. Our heart has burned within us. What they see, I don't know, it's speculation. Maybe they heard Jesus blessing the food. Maybe when He began to pray for that meal, they said, we've heard a prayer like that before. Nobody's prayed like this man. That this man prays with a different kind of authority. This man prays like the Son of God. Maybe they recognize His prayer. But I think in my, my humble but accurate opinion, what they saw was crucified marks in his hands. I think as Jesus was walking, they paid attention to his hands. They sat down to the meal. As he's breaking the bread and getting ready to serve, they saw the marks in his hands of the crucifixion. Guys, did you know that the only man-made thing in heaven be the crucified wounds of Christ? Everything else we made brand new. The Bible says that he will make all things new. New heaven, new earth, the way they were supposed to be, there would be one thing that will be an eternal reminder the way that man treated the Son of God. The nail pierced hands. And for eternity, we'll be able to worship and give glory to God because Jesus chose to take that punishment for us. And they saw that here at the table. So they rose up the very hour returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that happened on the road and how He was known to them in the breaking of bread. If you remember, they said to Jesus, Hey, it's late, it's dark, it's dangerous, come on in and stay with us. But as soon as they were realizing who He was, they didn't worry about the dark. They didn't worry about the danger. They got up and they went back to Jerusalem. I love I read today my devotion. talked about John and uh, Peter when they were arrested and they were, they were warned, don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. If you do, there's going to be great consequences. They said, we cannot but help to speak the things that we have seen the impact on their lives was what? Radically, dramatically changed. They went from being sad and sorrowful and concerned and worried and lost and walking away from Jesus to now being on fire, passionate, excited, ready to get back to Jerusalem to share this good news that Jesus has arose from the dead. And it says that their heart burned within them. Jesus disappeared, it says. The reason why Jesus didn't have to be with them now physically is because they now had this burning inside of them. If you remember, fire is representative of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, it says that there's cloven tongues like fire. Now they had a burning fire, the Holy Spirit inside of them. That's what happened on just a few days from this when Jesus sent it back to heaven. He says, good for me that I go away. If I don't go away, then I won't send the Holy Spirit the Comforter to you. But because I go away, I'll send the Holy Spirit to you to live inside of you. So Jesus no longer has to be with you. He is in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. When I read this thing about their hearts burning within them, I often think about John Wesley. I'll leave you this last thought. John Wesley was in the Church of England, a mover and a shaker as a young man. Lots of potential, lots of aptitude. He was at Oxford University and developed a holy club. They were very pious and very religious. He went to be a missionary in Georgia. And the old colony in Georgia. He came in with a colossal failure. A colossal failure. He hurt his reputation, hurt the cause of Christ. I think he was even charged with a criminal crime back on a boat, heading back to England to run away from the mess that he had made. 
He was religious to the lost. He had a desire to do the right thing, but he didn't have the ability to do it because he didn't have the Holy Spirit the burning inside of him. He got back to England. He didn't know what was next. And it just happened to be in God's providence that he was walking by the Aldergate Church and he heard some noise inside. He went into a late night service and was hearing of all things like an introductory to one of Luther's books. So I'm sure it was pretty dry stuff. Preacher was just reading this introductory, and something changed inside of John Wesley. He said, On that night, my heart was strangely warmed. That from that night on, his life was transformed, and his ministry was empowered, and he had opened this to be used greatly by God. And it had to happen after he had faith in God, his heart was strangely warmed. The Holy Spirit began to live inside of him. He was no longer trying to in his own strength live life and do ministry. The Holy Spirit now is able to live victoriously, powerfully through him. It only happens by seeing Jesus as he is and inviting him into your own, into your life, giving him his rightful place in your life. And bow and eyes closed.